doing this for a long time. Welcome to the first episode of the Broken Instruments podcast. In this particular episode, I feature my little sister, Avijin. Salve Regina, carry on. We've had these talks for years and we just happened to start recording some of them. Here's a snippet uh, where we talk about psychology and mental health. Two topics that I think are important to address at this time in our lives and also with what's happening in the world today. So to start us off, I feel like I can address that, that we've had a lot of good conversations, especially like when I used to live with the family and you were growing up. So I guess it only fits that we can like kind of just record talks. I mean, yeah. this is <clears throat> this is normally what we do. I feel like it's different now because I was more of the listener and I would just take it all in yeah. and then like learn it on my own. But now it's like, yeah. I'm, I actually have to talk about it. <laughs> I never talk about like psychology like this. Which is good. I guess that's the first thing since you brought it up. Why are you leaning towards psychology? I guess because when I was in high school, that was like the most where I felt like I was dealing with like all the different mental issues that I was going through and high like school. learning what they were. I also see other high school people deal with that too. And a lot of people deal with like bullying and stuff like that in high school. They fall into depression or they don't know who they find. Like they're not sure of who they are. So that like kind of makes them like not crazy, but like they try to fit in and then they lose the true person that's inside of them mm -hmm. in a way. So learning about all of that kind of led me to real like, seeing what I can do to help people understand that part, especially like in that time of their life. Mm. No one's talking about psychology in a different way towards these teenagers. They're just going to say, oh, this is this theory, this theory. But yeah. then like they don't elaborate on like how true it is to your own life as well. Mm -hmm. So, Or even how you could uh, use that in knowledge to help mm. yourself right now. Even in the future later on. Yep. So... Yeah, I got interested in like psychology. A lot of it also dealt with like the secret and like the voice of knowledge because that's what I was like reading at that time. Yeah. And, you know, it has like quotes of different psychologists, right? And stuff yeah. like that. So I was like, mm, what they say is like really interesting to me. And like if mm -hmm. they can like or say something like this and then like it could affect other per other people, like I like would want to do that too. Yeah. In the future for others. Especially for, like, the younger generation who is very, like, not naive, but, like, they're so, like, distracted with, like, social media right now, too. Yeah. That's definitely, like, the Our, biggest like, thing. Because technology. when I was in high school, we didn't have social media. I think at that point, MySpace was just, like, the biggest thing, but it wasn't even a lot. Mm -hmm. A couple years after that, there was a lot of talks about how social media could be kind of a negative thing if you yeah. use it too much or you get addicted to it. So I pulled myself off of social media because of that. And I felt like this was around the time that I was like searching more into psychology or just why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the work I did. Right. So working in adolescence, like I feel like it was it was meant to be because I hated dealing with, yeah, that age group. And I guess I had very little patience for like the drama and the, yeah. just, you know, the like cliques the of high school. Yeah, just petty. I mean, I, and I get it because, you know, being in high school, too, you get how that world is mm -hmm. where like the most important thing in life is to be like cool with friends and stuff. Also, you know? when you don't have like parents um, like guiding you. Yeah, exactly. Right. So so like you have that age group and um, working in mental health as a, as a nurse, it's it's when I saw so many things that can affect someone at such a young age and as much as i hate to admit it it's it really does fall on the parents mm -hmm. um at least what i've seen so i mean everything i'm bringing here is is just my view it's anecdotal it's my experience um but a number of times like the kids deal with you know um not even just abuse not 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 of abusive parents all the time it's it could just be busy parents mm -hmm. It could be um, parents that use substances to, to be able to function. And, you know, like the kids kind of take the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. So that alone got me really interested in um, mental health and, yeah, like how we could help. I'm Dealing with like that age group was just rough for me, though. <laughs> like I feel like on top of, you know, like the drama and like all the, you know, like the... the 
what passing notes the boys and girls and <laughs> like we had to monitor that they actually so, did that yeah oh yeah like they, they wanted to like i mean it's you're you have like 20 girls and like 15 boys on a unit that's co-ed mm-hmm. obviously they slept in different hallways for safety and stuff and they said they had groups separate oh. but they're they're in the unit together so like you know like they're eyeing each other and it's like you know they, we have to keep them separate so a lot of the day is like Making sure no one's passing notes, making sure no one does anything. They yeah, it's crazy. Like just go and talk to them. No, because it, it, with that, it hinders the treatment that we're giving somebody. Oh. We have to focus on their treatment. Mm-hmm. So that alone, ca- oh, well, relationships and all that stuff causes a lot of other issues. Yeah, true. when they're in the hospital to get better, mm-hmm. in a sense of like maybe managing their behavior and stabilizing mm-hmm. them. And um, so that they can go back out and function because you don't belong in the hospital, yeah. right? That's the idea. So it actually hinders treatment at that point. So yeah. that was like a big challenge already. So on top of just like that, now we're talking behavioral issues. Now we're talking about <sighs> mental health disorders, right? Mm-hmm. And it's scary to see that, you know, like so at such a young age, you know, like a 13 year old just doesn't even know what's happening. They just know that they hate the world Mm -hmm. or they want to, you know, shred up their arm. And yeah, I've seen it. I've seen all those, um, especially the serious ones, the ones that don't just cut for a thrill. It's Mm -hmm. like cut to like let out anger. And it's scary. Mm -hmm. I've seen arms like shredded up, like not to be too graphic, but like ground beef. Uh, and not even bleeding anymore because it's healing, but it's like ground beef. Like, yeah, if you can imagine raw. I, I, I've seen some yeah. <laughs> some people. And and a lot of it, well, I want to say most of it's like pattern-like, but then there's one patient I remember. She's like shredded up like. Every like limb. Yeah. And it's not just like cuts. It's like burns and it's bites and. And um, see, a, a case like that, you wonder, like at what, 14 years old, how do you get to that point? Yeah, how do you get to that point? And I think from her, for her case specifically, um, there's a long history of abuse. Mm. There was um, diagnosed mental health disorders already, like psychosis and you know, schizophrenia with um, delusions, hallucinations, right? So that alone, you could see how... You know that uh, that can affect somebody. Mm-hmm. It's just simply like a, being abused as a, at a young age or dealing with certain traumas. It, it's rooted now. Now she's dealing with those types of things, and she doesn't know how to function in life anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think that one in particular, she was like hearing the voice of the devil and things like that. Yeah, telling her like giving her command hallucinations, like command auditory hallucinations of like killing herself, yeah. killing us, and yeah, I, I want to say I worked with her for at least. A week and a half, like 10 days, maybe she was in the hospital. Um, but situations like that, it's like more common than you think. That's what's scary. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, what's interesting about mental health or the brain is my biggest fear that someone can be healthy, um, fully healthy, able bodied <laughs> with um, just something wrong upstairs. Mm hmm. You know, like maybe a part of their brain lacks the chemistry or lacks the neurotransmission. And now they're looking at you who's right in front of them. Even if they knew you once, you're someone else in the moment. And that's what scares me. An able-bodied person who has no regard for you or your safety. Um, Things that I've dealt with in mental health is just, it made me dive into and, and have a passion for learning how to help people better. Because mm-hmm. people like that get brushed under the the rug. Unfortunately, it's yeah. a stigma. So, um, I'm actually curious. Like, w- is there a psychologist that you lean towards, or you're super interested in? Uh, so far, no. But I just started reading, like, yeah, like about Freud in that book. In um, theories. Sigmund Freud. Um, Carl Jung was interesting. Carl Jung. Yep. Or Jung. Yeah, <laughs> Carl Jung. Carl <laughs> but I haven't looked much into him. But that was interesting because he put religion with yeah, um, the unconscious or something. Mm-hmm. And then Eric the Erickson's like stages of development, like that's kind of very relatable. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I could see it playing out. 
That one for <laughs> sure is something that I bring up every day. If I bring a clinical group to the hospital, mm-hmm. Eric Erickson, I think, outlined it perfectly. Um, but definitely like Carl Jung and like like the archetypes. Yeah. And you just see how someone's personality or the character is shaped. Mm-hmm. Right. And like something that I read is that he said people with schizophrenia tend to have like the same like hallucinations as like the or like the symbols that they see in like hallucinations are like the symbols that people use in like religion and like Mm -hmm. stuff like that so i thought that was kind of crazy how like like without them like even let's say having a religion they could already like have that in their mind instilled in their mind Mm -hmm. so like these symbols like i don't know if the yin and yang or like the mandala have like like a certain meaning already Mm -hmm. that's like they had they could like pull from their brain or something like that that brings up the uh, the idea that there's like this universal consciousness like we're born with it and this is interesting to me because you know amela's like she's about to be six months but i got super super interested on how babies brains develop right Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because i read more about it I, i saw some videos of like infants who just like like a month old or something they um they respond differently to you know facial expressions mm-hmm. so like that alone it, it's crazy to me because if you let's say i put up you know like i don't i wouldn't do that cuz it's like abuse but if i put a picture of like a roaring lion in yeah. front of her she'll get scared because it's like a beast it's a monster mm-hmm. with fangs and everything right mm-hmm. and then you put like a smiley face in front of a baby and then they smile so it's almost weird because, I mean, other, I mean, Joe Rogan podcast talks about it a lot too, where it's like, are we, do we inherit like a universal kind of library of, of thoughts and ideas and memories? Yeah. Um, or are we, are we simply connected telepathically somehow? Because um, there was a, there was one study about like this rat, I forget it was in Europe, I think, but um, they created a new maze and for a certain amount of time, no no mice got to the cheese. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as that first one did, there was a whole line in different areas of mice that got the cheese and they started getting faster and faster. So they started mm-hmm. improving that way. But these mm-hmm. were separate mice. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. Like, how does that work? So like the memory of our ancestors, do, does that get passed to us? And like we see, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you see, like we know that like a very angry face makes us feel different. Mm -hmm. And a baby can even respond to that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I think there's some element of like unconscious, subconscious, like programming that we have. Like if we have universal emotions, why can't we have like a universal conscious? Because that's filled with already those emotions. Yeah. It's crazy because like when when someone is, is like, you know... I would imagine in the tribe and a baby's born and they see like an animal that's like a ferocious animal, like they know. Mm -hmm. So that simple like survival mechanism is already ingrained in us Mm -hmm. that we know if like there's a loud noise, we're like alerted. Or if we see something like we want to run. It's crazy how like even our, our nervous systems are already programmed like that. Yeah. You know, but I mean, just like. Like those psychologists that you listed out there, that's the study of like, I mean, the mind, the brain, yeah. how we are dealing with life around us and how we learn and remember. It's super interesting to me. But um, I think that one of the most, um, okay, those, because Carl Jung and like Freud, like those dive into a little bit more controversial. Yeah. Um, Eric Erickson and I would say Maslow's hierarchy of needs have you like, you've seen that pyramid oh yeah i think yeah. those two are the ones that i refer to a lot when i work with my students because um in its simplest form everybody is somewhere on the pyramid everyone's mm-hmm. somewhere in the in the uh, the stages of development mm-hmm. and you bring up like adolescence like do you remember what the stage is it's like self-esteem or something like that <laughs> <laughs> kind of in adolescent stages actually um so uh, it's uh, identity versus role confusion uh, and it's ironic oh, that you brought that up yeah, yeah, yeah you you brought that up identity they don't mm-hmm. know where they don't know who they are yeah right um so with that alone like when i step into the hospital i have to think about that 
that if I approach something a certain way, if I say something a certain way, I might hurt the person. I might hurt my patient Trigger them. emotionally. So dealing with a patient like that, I have to speak a certain way. I have to understand where they're at in the stage. Um, simply, I mean, correlating that to someone older, like um, the last stage of development is that... Um, Generativity. After that, ego... Oh, I, oh, what is it? Ego versus despair. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it's like a very, very old person. Like they look at their life and, and think... You know, did I oh, integrity versus despair? That's mm-hmm. what it is. Integrity versus despair is did I say or did I do what I said I was going to do? Mm-hmm. And if not, you look at your life in despair and despair. So You're it, not it, fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. So so when you think of like if I'm going to interact in a geriatric setting with these old people, like there's a certain way I have to approach things. Mm-hmm. Now, if I. And that's the psychology of it, of like how I speak to them. If if they respond a certain way or I said one thing that brought up a, or triggered a bad memory, again, I can hurt them. I can hurt them emotionally and damage rapport. And that's mm-hmm. and that's hard because I got to work with them all day. And a lot of people don't highlight that. That's a, that's very important when you're working with people. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're going to be reading everybody and analyzing them every time you interact. But the more you get to know someone, you can actually pinpoint yeah. Where on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm-hmm. where do they need assistance in? Or if they're in a certain stage, you could be 50 years old and be stuck in identity versus role confusion. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. That's what Erickson said, right? Like, yeah. if you get stuck or if you don't make it through a stage, you actually get stuck there. So you can be 50 years old, <laughs> but still not know who you are. Yeah. And, and that's what's scary is that a lot of us... Um, don't realize that a lot of people living out in the world or, you know, you might have like that adult living with their parents right now mm-hmm. who doesn't know what to do with their life still. Yeah. So you would say like, oh, maybe that's even in an infancy stage. It's not wrong. We just have to be aware that someone could be stuck in an infancy stage. Like think about an infant trust versus mistrust where let's say they were abused as a kid. Yeah. And they're 45 years old. They never got over it. He never trusts anybody anymore. Yeah. So even like going to work, going, making friends, you're already, you're already betrayed by the people you're supposed to trust the most. Mm-hmm. Right. That's scary. And you could see how that could pave a totally different path than the like, quote unquote, like standard path yeah. that we're supposed to, to live, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but no, psychology is super interesting. And I, I love it to that point where I always wanted to study. Um. You said so two books that that really changed or at least got you intrigued was The Secret and and The Voice of Knowledge. Yeah, The Voice of Knowledge. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the Secret for sure was like the starting point, I think, to open up everyone's minds that there is something greater greater or more spiritual about what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. Right. What was the biggest takeaway they got from The Secret? Ask what you receive. No, <laughs> I think. The biggest thing I I think I got from The Secret was more of like being or being someone or like treating other people how I would want to be treated Mm -hmm. as well as also being like grateful for just being alive in a way because you're not if you're giving out energy that's like negative in a way it's like you're manifesting or your the law of attraction will give you another negative energy. So if I don't want that, then I have to be able to like have that good energy or good vibe in myself and part of me. So when I'm out there talking to different people or doing whatever, that will come out instead into the universe. And then hopefully the universe will, you know, good karma yeah. <laughs> in a way, good, give me good karma. And then also like just treating other people like different or like around that time because I was, you know, thinking about like sexuality and all that mm. and you know the the love the, like the love wins or whatever hashtags about like pride and all that uh-huh. so like i don't know i lost my train of thought <laughs> that's the secret yeah like but yeah that's what you got from it 
Yeah, because if you're treating other people with love at the same time, like I would want to like get love back. Mm-hmm. So like that helps me with like the relationships I also have, and then like mm-hmm. being grateful for those relationships help, and like seeing the good in like everything to be grateful about it mm-hmm. is like I think what helped me the most to feel I guess not so negative, more positive towards life yeah. in the end, and like just now. Like, using the secret now, it's more of just... It's not just, like, manifesting to me. It's also just, like, praying and, like, really, you know, putting, like, emotion towards it. Like, just... I don't know. I can't say, like, oh, I'm gonna get a house next year, but, like... Or I could pray about it, but then you still have to put in some work and your energy into it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I think that's where... People miss the point. Yeah. Because you think the secret, and when you, I mean, if if you've ever read the secret, it's very magical, I guess. Yeah. You know, like like vision boards and stuff, it, it's all good. And I think where it kind of doesn't highlight enough is that element of effort mm-hmm. and doing your part. Yeah. And, you know, we grew up very religious, right? Our family yeah. is very religious. And um, I remember reading it and... It challenged, it challenged a little bit of, you know, what we were brought up with. Like religion? Yeah, or at least in a sense that we can control more than I thought. Yeah. You know, and, and it got me to think, like, some people can take this book and <clears throat> think that, you know, That's God it. doesn't exist. That was one yeah. thing. It kind of It kind of challenged us to that point, but... I mean, you take it with a grain of salt and you see what you could apply to your life mm-hmm. for sure. And and for me, it strengthened my my faith mm-hmm. that there is a God and God exists in the world in many forms. And I mean, there's this overseer of this energy flow of the earth, you know, like that things move in the earth, not because I'm just vibrating that energy, yeah. but because, you know, there's part destiny and part choice of what we're supposed to do. Um, That's definitely something that really fundamentally changed the way I look at life from the secret. It Mm -hmm. was like, you know, the frequencies. Yeah. Like nothing good can come if you're in a bad frequency. Like that doesn't Mm -hmm. make sense. You know, if I approach a certain test or a certain situation with negative energy, how is a good outcome supposed to end up being the result? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, someone's going to say or approach a test like, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. And then miraculously, you're going to pass. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You're already approaching it and looking at it through that lens. Your vibration frequency is just off. Like with the universe. Yeah, it doesn't match. Yeah. Same thing with, well, and that's the thing. I feel like with the secret in particular, people go around saying, you know, you know, uh, thoughts become things. I believe that wholeheartedly or ask, believe and receive. Like, I believe that. But at the same time, it's like you get those people that kind of use that as like a, a like a scapegoat or like a yeah. weapon or a shield or something. And then like they're very negative. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, <clears throat> like they're like, <clears throat> excuse me, like they would approach it, something or a situation like, oh, my gosh, like I'm so worried. Like this sucks. Like, you know, everything sucks or whatever. And then, oh, but positive thoughts only. Yeah. Well, you saying that doesn't really cancel the fact that your energy vibration is super negative. That's true. I think the biggest thing that I took away from The Secret was um, to not pretend, but to believe that you already have it. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking about it, what I understood is being Mm -hmm. it. Being about it. Yeah. Like, instead (laughs) of chasing my dreams, I am... I'm living it ...the accomplishment of my dreams. So... That changes your frequency. I think that's what the book tries to get you to understand. Mm -hmm. But on the surface level, people get that mixed up. Mm -hmm. Like, but like if I, if I'm saying I want to, I want a house. Like the house is always something I'm chasing and it's in front of me. And the chasing energy will always make you chase the house. So it's like believing that you, that It's already written. Believing that you're doing everything in this moment to get that, to accomplish that, is the better energy than Mm -hmm. someday. It's like, because in the book, didn't they say like, 
or someone I heard somewhere like if you're chasing happiness, that means you're not happy or something exactly. like that. So why don't you just be happy? Yeah, <laughs> you have to like find change, content, find ways, right? Yeah, contentment and happiness yeah, in the moment. Content. Yeah, you know and that that, that brings changes up your frequency. Yeah, exactly. So that that's the the funny thing. Like I don't know if you read it, but I know I gave Matt the um the art, subtle art. Yeah, the subtle <laughs> art of not giving a you know, and that outlines it perfectly, like. Striving hard for a happy life mm-hmm. is, in fact, a negative thought. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Now, being content with the life you have is already the positive frequency that you want to be, be vibrating on. Yeah. So it's, it's a weird thing. It's a weird dynamic that people have to figure out in the world and that we had to figure out, that we have to yeah. still figure out on how we can maximize that into the life that we want mm-hmm. now. Not in the future, not, you know, and I think we could both agree that from that point, our family did shift yeah. in <laughs> frequency and vibration. And I guess uh, our outlook was better in life when all that stuff flooded in. And I yeah. feel like that led me to more things that led me to um, like the four agreements you know, that led me to more of like Don Miguel de Ruiz, yeah. Deepak Chopra, all those more spiritual and not necessarily like, you know, like woo woo stuff. But that led me to more of those different teachings. Right. So and I think Don Miguel Ruiz was a huge one for me. The four agreements, the fifth agreement, mastery of love, mm. voice of knowledge, circle of, um, you know, like the circle of fire. It was like, it brought it to a more natural human state mm-hmm. of, you know, like what we should be doing in the world and like how our minds can yeah. dictate how the world's going to be, you know, not just thinking right, it, like, but approaching life a certain way, dealing with people a certain way that n- sometimes knowing too much is a downfall for us. Um, and I think that's what got me to the voice of knowledge because I read the four agreements and literally one of the first quotes is from John Lennon in the Beatles. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like the best way to live in this world is to misunderstand everything that you see because mm-hmm. it causes you to dig deeper. It causes you to look beyond surface and find the real meaning of things mm-hmm. because a lot of this world and we can speak to our world now, it's smoke and mirrors, man. People control the narrative mm. when something's brought out, something's brought out into the world. And it's like, um, it's not necessarily true. Yeah. But people will believe it. Yeah. Blindly. See it. Yeah. So, and that quote stuck with me for a long time. And that's why I dove into Don Miguel Ruiz stuff. And, um, you know, like even, I mean, you mentioned the voice of knowledge. What was that big <laughs> revelation, I guess, from that revelation? book for you? Um, For me, it was like, being a child (laughs) like having an inner child Mm -hmm. way of like looking at life but you know still being able to like not mature but like grow and develop as a good person Mm -hmm. at the same time because they he said like when we were kids um we looked at life or we just did whatever we wanted to do at that moment like if we wanted something we would act we would act in a way to get it like if someone wanted if the child was like hungry or whatever he'd cry right and he got what he he wanted so not necessarily i will cry (laughs) when i'm like a teenager yeah no yeah (laughs) like the thing is you still have to act like use that as a motivation to um get what you want get your goals and stuff like that that's another thing like it relates to the secret because you still have to put in your effort yeah yeah, but then you also have like a different perspective of like the world because in when you're a kid, you don't think that nothing won't come to you in a way, right? Yeah. Like you feel like you can just do whatever you want True. and just like live life with no care. True. So like having that mind, like not mindset, but like looking like at the world and like life like that mm-hmm. while at the same time you're putting your effort and your energy in it, I feel like yeah. that can make a difference for you. For the rest of your life. Because what it says is like (laughs) knowledge can limit you Mm -hmm. because you talk yourself out of things a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like 
I mean, uh, the five second rule, like Mel Robbins, have you heard of her? She's like, she's like that pioneer of like, um, before you talk yourself out of something and it, it helps you just take action right away. Like if you're yeah. lazy to get up from your bed, she said that she was going through the hardest time in her life. And, um, one day at work, she like, they were like, um, they were broadcasting a, a rocket launch and she just had this idea that next time I, I, I know I need to do something. Before I talk myself out, I'm going to program my frontal cortex, my, my decision making um, in a five second countdown. So mm-hmm. it's like you wake up and that part of you that's like already starting to talk yourself out. Yeah. You hijack that with the, okay, I'm going to get up in five, four, three, two, one, go. And like it kind of hijacks <laughs> your mind. That already like made me like stop breathing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See, it's so weird because it does program you. When there's a countdown, it's like there's something big. Yeah. And that already hijacks the thought of like, oh, maybe five more minutes. Yeah. So before you even get to that point, she was pioneering that idea of just go, just do it. You know, and, and when you said like that whole thing about um, like, I mean, babies and children and how how they, they just they are just them. Yeah. And they know what they want. And that's it. Like, mm-hmm. so there's a balance that we have to get back to that without obviously being like a child. Yeah. But um, the uh, another book that changed my life was Relentless by Tim Grover. Mm. I don't know if I let oh. you read it. Did I let you read that? I think you gave me the audio book, but Dude, like... So, okay, so that book changed like, my way of looking at as far as like effort. And like Relentless is, is simply highlighting like the unstoppable forces mm-hmm. that humans can Was have. this the book that you like gave the example of like a locksmith? Oh, yeah. When I, I kind of stepped up past it so the relentless like the 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 highest level in relentless is what they call a cleaner Uh. there's coolers there's closers and there's cleaners and the book relentless is basically outlining that there's this element in all of us where if you want something done that you will be unstoppable if you really choose to Mm -hmm. and the unstoppability work it, it goes along with the hard work the relentless mindset and relentless pursuit of your goals and mm-hmm. like that's what they talk about. Um, children are relentless. There's no talking them out of something. Yeah. If they're hungry, they're hungry. And I'm mm-hmm. seeing even more now with Amela. It's mm-hmm. funny because <laughs> yeah, like there's nothing else. Like and the world adjusts to them. Yeah. So you take that level of intensity and you put it, you apply it to a CEO or a Michael Jordan. You know, mm-hmm. the book is a lot about Michael, and you're in his way. You better get out of the way because mm-hmm. he's gonna get it. Mm-hmm. like by mm-hmm. any means necessary you know and and it's it's being able to tap into that relentless mindset that relentless attitude is where really like where a lot of people do shine mm. and and that's that book outlines that perfectly because it's like you know when you have a kid you don't get mad at the kid for wanting food yeah you know because that's what they do they're yeah. supposed to eat that's what they're supposed mm-hmm. to do so if you can apply that mindset to something else in our adult life man like that book changed the way I looked at things and like ultimately that book got me to make decisions like going to nursing education and going there with that relentless mindset. That's mm-hmm. why in my office, you see that Michael Jordan and Kobe posters, yeah. like those two posters of them shooting at the buzzer. <laughs> like I always looked at life as those moments. Like if I was afraid to do something, I would look at that poster before I would leave the house. And like, I would always look at that as like, this is my shot. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think too much, you have, you know, the voice of knowledge will talk you out and it'll psych you out. You know, that book, Relentless, and Kobe and Michael and all these people, Tiger Woods, they, they get into that zone. They call it the zone, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're completely free of mind. You're completely free of body. If you ever felt that in the past where it's like time just flies and you're just in the moment. Yeah. You're relentlessly in the moment being you and... It's beautiful. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, dang, I don't know how I did that. Mm-hmm. Or that was an amazing feeling. You tapped into the zone. And, I, and that's something I've always wanted to tap into. I would learn about it more. Yeah. So like. So how would you tap into the zone? There's a lot of things now. There's a lot of strategies that I use now. Um, changing your mindset for sure uh, is something that I use now. I know that your mindset kind of is like a lens on how you view things. So when I read the book in particular, when I was facing new challenges, 
I had to find a way to trust my instincts, mm. trust in myself and what I do best, and relentlessly practice that. And I think what a perfect example is, you know, Kobe Bryant in the 2010 um, season, when he was preparing for that championship, mm -hmm. his body was tore up and everything, and he, his finger was broken and everything. It didn't matter. He took a thousand shots a day, even on game day, mm -hmm. before the game. So that when it came to it in the game, when there's five seconds left and he's going to take a shot, he did it a thousand times. So he doesn't have to think. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a way to to find that middle space between like thoughts and feelings and time where time stands still yeah. because you've done it so much. Dang. You know, and, and it's tapping into that level of understanding that you could do whatever you want to do and that fear doesn't exist in the zone. Thoughts, overthinking doesn't exist in the zone. You know, if, if you I have it in one of my notes, like one thing I got from the book is nothing is more powerful than a cleaner in his motherfucking zone. <laughs> that's what, you know, that's really it. You know, like a, a bull is going to be a bull. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, a bull's not going to be like, if he sees food or if he sees a threat, yeah, he's coming for you with his, with his horns. That's his zone. There's no like <laughs> human idea that we have is like oh should i should i um yeah. no i probably shouldn't because it might hurt yeah see that alone that voice talks us out of it you're out of the zone and kobe even said it um on his last game you remember like the late kobe Bryant, man the his last game was in 2016 yeah april 13 2016 that, that was the original mamba day but he scored 60 that night And he's like, if you watch the first game, or if you watch the first quarter of that game, he missed like first six shots. Mm. And he said he because he was trying so he was trying too hard to get himself into the zone. Uh. And then so there's that element of like balancing the emotions and thoughts. Right. So mm. he said he would feel it. And this is what I use my strategy as far as like ending my, my job and like leaving my job to go into a new job. It was like the, I, I looked at it as like a farewell tour. Like the way Kobe had it. Every arena he went to, they had tributes to him and stuff. Yeah. That will mess with your emotions. That'll mess with your head. Be like, oh my God, this is the last time I'm playing in Madison Square Garden. I want to soak it up. See, but he even said, if you're thinking that, you're out of the zone. Hmm. You're not going to perform. Mm -hmm. So he said, walk into his last game. He knew it was going to be his last game in the Staples, right? He said like he would look out into the hallway, to the tunnel and you feel that emotion and, and that nerves, like the nerves are, are creeping up again. Yeah. And he said, you know what? No, just move, just move forward. Step. Well, that's the number one thing you got to do right now. Because as soon as you start getting your head into emotions, you're not going to perform. Then he started playing the game, you know, like he, he blocked out that this is his last game. He forgot that, you know, yeah. don't think, just go. He started missing his shots. As soon as you start thinking like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. As soon as you're thinking that, you're out. Mm -hmm. So he said, "You know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be me. I'm just gonna play basketball. Yeah. Forget that it's my last game. Forget that I missed the last six shots. The next one is probably gonna go, and I'm gonna shoot. Hmm. All of a sudden, he goes on this rampage, and he he scores 60. Now at the end of the game, they're interviewing him. Yeah. I think you could search the interview. And he was like, you know, like Kobe, like, what were you thinking? Like, you know, how did you get to that that space? And he's like, well, there's. It's funny because. If you're even if you're in that element and you're in the zone, mm -hmm. as soon as you acknowledge, oh shoot, I'm in the zone right now, you're, you're out, of out of it. <laughs> you're out of it already. That's it's crazy. So like that book really got me to understand that you could tap into that and the strategies that you can use to get into that and how to stay there. You know? And I, I apply that to everything I do, like whether it be teaching, like lecturing or running simulations at school. And it's just being me and afterwards everything just made sense everything was perfect you know mm -hmm. and time flew time didn't exist in those moments you know so it's just amazing that i came across books and and you know you came across books that we can learn more about how we can hack the system now if, if i wish i knew this in my 20s i wish i knew this in my teens mm -hmm. i was like man imagine me as a teenager in high school, knowing what I know now, 
Now, obviously, that can't happen. That can't exist. And it was meant mm-hmm. to be like this yeah. in my life. But I, I imagine like a, a high schooler getting the amount of understanding that I have right now. And I'm like, man, I would have been relentless. I would have been unstoppable, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is why like you're 20, right? Yeah. And you have so much in front of you. Like this is amazing for you. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, like you have so many tools at your disposal and we can, we yeah. can claim a lot of things like technology was one of the key roles in advancing all this stuff. Yeah. Audio books was, were huge for me because I didn't have time to sit down and read a lot anymore. So I used the audio books like when I would drive to work. I had a 40 minute drive, you know, uh, to work mm-hmm. when I was a nurse. Um, I listened to audio books before my lectures on the way to work for that, you know, here, like here and there. And learning is easier now. It's faster. Mm. But the weird thing is the fact that it's so available people don't really find the urgency. Mm. I don't know about you, but like, you know, when you, when you, uh, you subscribe to like Netflix or something, we subscribe to like almost everything, you know I mean? You're at the Gracie and the fact that there's so much, I don't know what to watch. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that weird? Yeah. Like, and they're like, Oh, that movie, like, like, Oh my God, I haven't seen that. Whatever. Yeah. So now which one? (laughs) You don't know what to choose because there's so much. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what we learned is in the moment, just make that decision. Like, you got to mm-hmm. feel where you're at because I believe that that's intuition. Yeah. Like, you know what's right. You know what you could do. But in the moment, that can change because you're in a different state than you were 10 minutes ago. And things, the good ideas now don't end up being good ideas in a couple of days. Now you choose. Like, is the intuition telling you you know, like whatever you, whatever intuition is to you, inspiration, the way, you know, the energy of the world talks to you. I don't know. But it's like in this moment, I feel like watching this. Just do it. Mm-hmm. That's what, that, that's what it's telling you. And like, that's why we started these talks. Because I was just like, I'm just thinking of what we could do. Yeah. And it just happened to be a time that you were looking for something, mm. you know. And I believe that. I believe there's intuition, like kind of moving things around. So yeah. like, see that what we're talking about is us navigating a world of so many ideas, so many feelings and emotions, uh, billions and trillions of circumstances that can happen. It's for me now, I understand that we have to strengthen our fundamental and foundational core of who we are so that we can navigate all these trillion situations that we're mm-hmm. about to encounter. You know, so whatever situation we're ready for it. In a way, it's like having faith in yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And having faith in yourself because of maybe you have faith in a bigger, a higher power, a creator or something. Mm-hmm. If you have faith in yourself alone, that is faith. Yeah. That's a strong belief, you know? So it, it's trusting yourself that Trust. given any situation, you'll be okay and you'll know what to do. Mm-hmm. Trust me, like I, you know before stepping into a classroom and going over the lecture, it, it's to that point where it's like, I was studying the night before the morning of a lecture that I was supposed to give. Cause I have to be ready for all angles, like different perspectives on how they look at this PowerPoint. Yeah. What questions are they going to have for me? And I had to prepare relentlessly whether they ask those questions or not. I'm prepared. And I think that's what, what I'm kind of talking about with relentless. It's like, you've prepared for any possible outcome. You know, I think um, in the book, they outline Navy SEALs and let's say they're they're doing an operation and they've practiced the operation hundreds of times and they expect 10 different outcomes. Like, you know, the plan is to approach from the east side door entrance. Mm-hmm. And when you enter the door, there's a stairway to the right, right? Like that's yeah. the first step. You walk up to the door and it's locked. We have to be prepared for those situations, like yeah. curveballs that we didn't anticipate. Mm-hmm. So, like, I think the book says, like, you could be like, you prepare for 10 different scenarios and there's still that 11th one. Mm-hmm. You have to trust that you can make good decisions in the moment. And from there, be and do what you do. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter the circumstances. I have one goal in mind, I have one mission, you know? So, I applied that to everything. Like yeah. you have to ask me a question I don't know. I know how to answer it. I know um, what I don't know. I know what I do. Um, I'm prepared for 30 different questions on this one slide. 
If they never ask it, it's fine. But I need to master it because that's who I am. Yeah. I want to be prepared for any possible outcome. And that goes along with like living life. Sometimes like um, now that I I kind of dialed back on education, you know, I don't do clinical groups, but being here at home, it's you don't know what the day has for you. So you you have to get ahead of it. You have to prepare for it. Expect the best things to happen. Mm -hmm. Prepare for the worst. That's really it. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that's a good way to prepare for life. I mean, no one prepared for 2020. Mm -hmm. No one knew that this was going to happen. True. You know? So now it's, I mean, I I didn't feel like my world flipped upside down, but I know for some people, for a lot of people, that was the case. Mm -hmm. They feel like they lost everything. They might have lost everything. Now, I think everybody's hope, uh, hopefully everyone's realizing like nothing's promised in this world. So prepare for the worst, but expect the best. Mm 